Hello, my friends. Welcome to today's q and I got a really good question from one of my friends here from my Houston, Texas course. I want to say thank you for writing in. And this student says, I have two areas I struggle with. Number one is agile. I'm struggling with the various responsibilities of the different roles. What all is the Scrum Master's responsibilities, the product owners, and development teams, stakeholders, so on and so forth. Who is responsible for what and is not responsible for various aspects? For some reason, these questions always get me. Thank you so much for asking this question. And honestly, it could be tricky if you have not honed in on the Scrum Guide. As you know, Agile is very wide. You've got flow-based Agile, which is Kanban and things like that, that do not have a confined time box or cadence that is repeated. And then you have Scrum, which is called iteration-based agile. But in the context of the exam, the three roles are pretty much the same in the world of Scrum and in the world of the PMP exam. And that's why I want to point you to Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland's Scrum Guides. And at a very high level, the product owner is the chief value officer. They understand the product. They understand the stakeholder and the customer, what they want and why. They understand the value of what is in the backlog. You see, it's called product backlog, product owner. They own the backlog. It's all up to them. If the product owner challenges anything in the backlog, they have the final say. So when it comes to understanding what is in the backlog, why it's there, the value of what is in the backlog, the prioritization of the backlog, even though the product owner may ask the team for some advice and ideas, but it's still ultimately on the product owner. And that's why we say product owner is a chief value officer. Now, before we go into all the other roles in the Scrum Guide, I want to point out the high level. The developers are just what you see is what you get. Develop. They develop stuff. So when it comes to the developers, the developers understand what they can do. The developers understand what their capacity is. And when a developer pulls an item from the product backlog to themselves and take ownership of that thing, then they work on it. They do it. They execute it. And that's their role. It's really the role of the developers to get the requirements, get the requests, get the stories, whatever is needed, and to understand it so they can translate that into a product, a service, whatever the result is. And as for the Scrum Master, the role of the Scrum Master is one of a coach for the team. The Scrum Master understands Scrum inside out and knows how best to carry out these Scrum events. The Scrum Master is chiefly what I call an impediment remover. They remove the impediments. They clear the obstacle for the team. Okay, so at a very high level, those are those three. Now, let's go into some further detail going into the Scrum Guides. And just follow me. I'm going to scrumguides.org. So go on down to scrumguides.org and let's take a look. When you hit scrumguides.org, you can see it's broken down very coherently. You've got the 353 on the left, but let's click on Scrum Team. The first thing we have here is developers, and it says, let's zoom in. Developers are the people in the Scrum Team that are committed to creating any aspect of a usable increment each sprint. The specific skills needed by the developers are often broad and will vary with the domain of work, like in your world of engineering, construction, mechanical, a different set of skills for the developers. In the world of IT, it's going to be different. In the world of healthcare, it's going to be different. Developers are always accountable for creating a plan for the sprint, the sprint backlog, instilling quality by adhering to a definition of done, adapting their plan each day towards the sprint goal, and holding each other accountable as professionals. For the product owner, who I call the chief value officer, they're accountable for, watch it, maximizing the value of the product resulting from the work of the Scrum team. How this is done may vary widely across organizations, Scrum teams, and individuals. The product owner is also accountable 
for effective product backlog management, which includes developing and explicitly communicating the product goal, creating and clearly communicating product backlog items. So this one, if the team is ever stuck and says, we don't know what this backlog item is, well, you go to the product owner for clarity, ordering the product backlog items and ensuring that the product backlog is transparent, visible, and understood. The product owner may do the above work or may delegate the responsibility to others. Regardless, the product owner remains accountable. And you do know what accountable means. Belly button accountability, ultimately answerable. You could say that responsible means the doer, but accountable means passing the buck stops here. Passing the buck stops with that individual who's accountable. All right, for product owners to succeed, the entire organization must respect their decisions. These decisions are visible in the content and ordering of the product backlog and through the inspectable increment and the sprint review. The product owner is one person, not a committee. The product owner may represent the needs of many stakeholders in the product backlog. Those wanting to change the product backlog can do so by, watch this, trying to convince the product owner. You see, I said the product owner is really powerful. All right, going over to the Scrum Master. Scrum Master is accountable for establishing Scrum. As defined in the Scrum Guide, they do this by helping everyone understand Scrum theory and practice, both within the Scrum team and the organization. The Scrum Master is accountable for the Scrum team's effectiveness. That's a very big word. So if the Scrum team is not performing effectively, the Scrum Master needs to ask, uh oh, what am I doing wrong? What am I not doing? How can I expose the team to additional tools and ideas and synergies? And how can I get them to be optimized? It says they do this by enabling the Scrum team to improve its practices within the Scrum framework. Scrum masters are true leaders who serve the Scrum team and the large organization. The Scrum master serves the Scrum team in different ways through coaching, helping the Scrum team focus on creating high value increments, causing impediment removal, ensuring that all Scrum events take place. This is a big one. So the Scrum master may not necessarily be at every single event, it would be good, but for mature teams, we want to make sure that the events hold. We don't need to babysit every single event. The Scrum Master serves the product owner in several ways, including helping find techniques for effective product goal definition and product backlog refinement, helping the Scrum team understand the need for clear and concise product backlog items, helping establish empirical product planning, for a complex environment and facilitating stakeholder collaboration as requested or needed. The Scrum Master serves the organization in several ways, including leading training and coaching the organization. You see that we're talking about servant leadership at a high level across the entire organization, planning and advising Scrum implementations within the organization. See that entire organization, helping employees and stakeholders understand and enact an empirical approach for complex work and removing barriers between stakeholders and scrum teams. So my friend, you have seen here from your awesome question that there's a lot to unpack. I would say go on down to scrumguides.org, read through what I've shown you. And also don't forget, as you read the PMI's Agile Practice Guide, they also have their own bend, their own slant and twist. Because when you find this on the PMP exam, it's going to be the project manager did blah, blah, blah. You may not see the word scrum master as much. I know it's a little bit annoying, but that's how PMI role is called project management professional. So you can expect to find a lot of you are project manager, blah, blah, blah. Even in an agile environment, even in the world of Scrum, you will still hear some mention of a project manager in a lot of those questions. All right. So I hope that sorts it out for you as far as that is concerned. Uh, if you need further clarity, do let me know. Now, the second part of the question, it says... The second one is untraditional. Struggling with the inputs and outputs for all processes. Here's the news flash. This exam does not have ITTOs, inputs, tools, techniques, and outputs pronounced. Please don't spend time going over and over again trying to cram them. No, you don't need to cram them, but you do need to understand what they are. Okay, so read the definition, understand what it does. Let me give you a simple example, which sounds convoluted at first. MCDA, multi-criteria decision analysis. What is that? Well, it's just using multiple criteria before you decide on your decision. 
Think about it. You go to the local restaurant, or maybe it's the fast food joint, regrettably. <laughs> you find yourself there and you say, what should I eat? And you look at the menu and you are immediately weighing how long it is going to take for them to produce what you're looking at. That's one criteria, the time. Another criteria could be, oh, will this fill me? Someone says salad on the menu, forget it. <laughs> Not going for that. Where you looked at the size and you looked at the time, that's two criteria. And maybe you look at the health factor. That's a third criteria. And then you look at the cost. That's a fourth criteria. So MCDA is just looking at multi-criteria. It says multiple criteria, multi-criteria decision analysis. It sounds, oh my goodness, what's this? But when you look under the hood, you're like, oh, is that all it is? I do this all day long. I use MCDA as I'm driving along. Where, where am I going? Which road am I going to take to work? Is it going to be the freeway? Is it going to be inroads? Oh, the freeway is always jammed. The inroads. You, so you make trade-offs, but it's based on multiple criteria, the way you go to work. So all of this to say, my friend, you don't have to cram inputs, tools, techniques, and outputs. You need to understand them so that you can explain them in everyday language back to yourself. And as long as you've been able to do that, move on, because the exam is so not ITTO based anymore, okay? It is based on your understanding of those things, not your cramming of those things. So as far as cheat sheets regarding the ITTOs, um, the tools and techniques, I honestly wouldn't worry about it. There's a book that you were given in class so for those of you coming to my training on Saturday to the PMP exam immersion, I have so many books available for you. One of the books is this one, right? It's called Project Management Essentials. And my friend who asked a question, you've got this book. If you go to the back of the book, you see itemized there are 400 definitions, 400 definitions. You see that? All of those terms and definitions, all I need you to do is flip the pages over. You're probably going to be done in an hour or less. Uh, because what I did with this was to distill the, the big old verbose definitions in other books like PMBOK guides. I took all those definitions, I whittled them down, and I shortened them to one sentence apiece. So if you go through this, you've got the book. If you go through this, it will be a lot easier. In the same token, while we're talking about definitions, the Agile Principle Run and Cut book, you know, you've got this one as well. At the back of the book, I also have definitions from an Agile perspective. Um, and finally, since you're going to be there on Saturday, I believe you've registered, you're also going to get the PMP Exam Immersion book. And the PMP Exam Immersion book really just goes into the exam content outline. This is based on the blueprint uh, for the exam. So the blueprint on which the PMP exam is based um, is what, what we use to write this book, PMP exam immersion. All right, so on Saturday, December 16th, we are going in for the kill on this book, right? We're gonna unravel it. And when you come to the program, what you're gonna notice is I'm hyper-focused on situational thinking for the exam. All the ITTOs and stuff are good, but you don't have to cram them. So I don't have I don't have any cheat sheets anymore. I used to. But what I would recommend to master in this content is just go to Google. And when you go to Google, just type in PMP fills cheat sheet. And when you type in fills cheat sheet, the first thing that should come up is my cheat sheet for the PMP exam, which helps you recall the processes. And as you look at the cheat sheet, I'm just gonna show it to you over here. It's like, you know, the first thing that comes up, Phil's cheat sheet, just type that in Google, Phil's PMP cheat sheet. And uh, you'll get this cheat sheet, you can download it. But I don't focus on the ITTOs in, instead, what I focus on is helping 
you understand what each process is. So I shorten the process definition. And instead of the process name, I have the definition to force you to recall, okay, authorize the project charter, authorize a project manager. What is this? Oh, it's develop project charter and so on and so forth. Uh, this is the most I would recommend beyond, you know, this having a ton of lists for ITTOs, uh, input tools, techniques, it's excessive. You're only going to have wasted your time if you're cramming ITTOs. All right. A word is enough for the wise. I know you got what I mean. Don't cram the ITTOs. Focus on the process. Know the process. Know the order of what the project manager does, and you'll be laughing all the way to the score bank. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate the question, and I look forward to seeing you on Saturday. Bye for now.